what grade? We're on. So I would like uh, to welcome everyone. Welcome everyone to the regular meeting of the Board of Commissioners of the Humboldt Bay Harbor Recreation and Conservation District. Today is June 9th, 2022. And our regular session is about to begin. Um, I call to order the regular session with a roll call. Larry. Commissioner Newman? Here. Commissioner Coleman? Here. Commissioner Marks? Here. Commissioner Higgins? Yes. And President Taylor? Yes, here. Um, at this point, I would like to do the Pledge of Allegiance. Stephen, would you lead us? Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Brian, a report out on closed session? Yes, the uh, board took no reportable action during closed session. Um, all right, we'll move on to item four, public comment. This portion of the agenda allows the public to speak to the board on the various issues not itemized on this agenda. A member of the public may also request that a matter appearing on the consent calendar be pulled and discussed separately. Do we have anybody that would like to speak on items not on the agenda? If so, please signify by speaking out, raising your hand, or Signaling, signaling us with some appropriate gesture. Royal, would you like to speak? Uh, yes, I would. Go. This, this is a portion of the agenda to speak on things not on our agenda. I understand that. I appreciate your time, commissioners. My name is Royal McCarthy. I'm a member, one, one of the veterans that's associated with the LSIL 1091. We're a group of veterans that's gotten together and formed a, a nonprofit corporation for the uh, development of a um, for free museum using the 1091 as a, as a uh, uh, basically a building. And we're currently located just east of the Timber Heritage, Asso Tim Timber Heritage Association or a temporary location. And uh, we're, we would like to be put on the agenda to uh, discuss our permanent location where we could be moved to. Uh, we're a group of veterans, as I said, we're looking to um, portray or actually uh, showcase the history of the 1091 from its inception when it was built in the Great Lakes through its, its career in the Pacific theater and then on to uh, Korea and its uh, civilian life as a canner up in Alaska and finally, as an albacore fisher here out of uh, Eureka. And it's um, uh, actually uh, part of the naval presence that's been part of the Humble Bay uh, existence for quite a while, dating back in, in uh, World War II when CB and I was here building boats and then the, the Blimp Base and so forth and Centerville and a few other items. So. Uh, we'd like to be put on the agenda so we could discuss uh, where our permanent location will be. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, we'll try to coordinate to get them on either the July or the August agenda. If that's yeah, I'll run it by the, the board president and we'll get them on the agenda. Yeah, and we'll we'll set up a meeting where we can talk to them. Okay, um, any any other comments on items not on the agenda? All right, seeing none, we're going to move on to the consent calendar. I'll make a motion we accept the consent calendar. Second, I have a motion and a second. I don't need to go to public comment on the consent calendar. All in favor? Signify by saying, oh, I'm sorry, it's roll call still. Commissioner Marks. Yes. Commissioner Higgins. Yeah. Commissioner Newman. Yes. Commissioner Coleman. Yes. And Commissioner Dale. Yes.
So we'll uh, move into item six, communication reports and correspondence received. Executive director's report. Uh, we'll just keep the report um, brief is that uh, the one thing I wanted to bring to your attention is, is that the Army Corps of Engineers is uh, set to start dredging uh, the entrance channel pretty soon. And as part of the, the, the normal protocol for you know surfer, surfers and commercial vessels to make sure you get them a wide berth, uh, because they can't make uh, quick maneuvering turns and other things. And it's really critically important that they operate freely uh, when they're dredging to keep the, the channels open. And so they should be coming up here within the next couple of weeks to start uh, those dredging activities to take approximately a million cubic yards of material uh, to uh, hoods. And staff is busy. There's a lot of activity that's going on. Um, are all over the place. Everything from Fields Landing to the Redwood Marine Terminal 2s, uh, we're, we're really clicking along uh, pretty nicely at the staff level. Um, there's a, there's a, a few issues that, that we always have, but nothing significant and not, nothing major. And there's a number of items on the agenda, and I'm just going to uh, turn it over from there. Um, I don't know, I, is there any other staff reports, Chris or Rob? Your mic is over to the side. We're, we're loading the slides now. Yeah, no, I didn't put, is that yours? This is, yeah. Okay, so um, from a facility standpoint, just want to update everyone that we've uh, moved the dredge spoils for beneficial reuse. They're now over in the town of Samoa. Uh, we'll be doing some cleanup work here over the coming couple of weeks to close out this project, but thought it was a very worthy thing to, to, to share with everyone. Um, next slide, please. Sorry, I don't have the button. We had a, a power fire again out at RMT-1. Um, staff acted quickly. We brought in a mobile generator. This time, instead of four months, we only needed it for one week to be able to restore it, get our fisherman power back at Robin Marine Terminal 1. Uh, we're real grateful for uh, California Road Company and Pete Jackson for jumping in right away and assisting us with this. This is uh, the before and after the Arcturus. You know, we've been busy demoing uh, the vessels down at Phil's Landing Boatyard that we thought we would never get rid of. So a uh, little picture of the Arcturus getting demoed and uh, what it looked like when the boat was gone. And then this is what we pumped out of the Arcturus. We removed um, uh, 20 55-gallon drums of uh, spent diesel fuel or, or old diesel fuel and the remainder of bilge water. So this was sent to a proper waste disposal site. Uh, some of it were recycled uh, and um, we're happy to have that off of, uh, off of our plate. And then finally here at Roadland and Marina, um, we've had a lot of challenges with our two ton hoist over the past couple of years. So we're in the process of rebuilding that hoist. So we've got a good working two ton hoist at the wharf dock. And uh, that's the facilities report for this month. Thanks Chris. Seeing no other staff reports, district council treasurer reports, district council. No report from council. Commissioner and committee reports. Commissioner Newman. Sorry. <clears throat> I just wanna apologize for not making last month's meeting. I was out of town salmon fishing and our seasons are very short and remote. And uh, I'm hoping that won't happen again this this summer, but it may. I did meet with uh, the folks that uh, <clears throat> came on during um, public comment from the 1091. I was very excited to learn about some of their plans and hopefully be able to uh, get involved with that in the near future. And I also met with the folks from the Longshore and Warehouse Union. Uh, a couple of days ago, and I'm very interested in their their thoughts about uh, district's plans with the uh, wind energy in the future. Otherwise, I'm a little sore from getting a wisdom tooth out yesterday, and that's my report. Ah. 
You're doing pretty good for having the wisdom tooth put out. Mr. Commissioner Coleman. Thank you. Uh, not too much to report, but I do have a couple slides, I guess, that I saw flash up there. Uh, that everyone knows or should know the kinetic grand championship was held once again. And so there I am in Norman the bee. Uh, he was a seaworthy bee, uh, floated past the marina and completed the full three day course from Arcata to Ferndale. Uh, Are you an ace? I'm a previous ace. I'm not an ace from uh, this past year. Okay. All right. We didn't we didn't sign up to ace, but I, I am a previous ace kinetic pilot. Uh, and then, yeah, I guess not you really. You pumped in that photo. I, <laughs> you know, it's not as aerodynamic and light as it might appear, and it doesn't appear very aerodynamic and light. So yeah, it's it's a workout pedaling that thing. Um, Glad to see that back on. Yeah, it, was, it seemed like a lot of people had fun. There were 38 uh, teams that registered. I'm not sure how many of them actually completed. It was a pretty windy and wet weekend, but it was a lot of fun. Um, yeah, Thanks for keep, for keeping now. that culture alive. Yep. That is really a unique North Coast event. It certainly is, and it's it's uh, honestly one of the funnest things that happens in this county. Commissioner Marks. Well, I participated in the Wind Energy Task Force uh, meeting um, that uh, Commissioner Dale and I are on. Um, there was over 400 people on the call. There's a lot of interest. There's, there's a lot of traction that's happening. Um, they're really pushing community benefit uh, projects, you know, for the future. So uh, that that's what's going on on that uh, field. And as far as, hey, I drove by the Kinetic Scopes races on the bridge. <laughs> you know, did you honk at them? I, I did not honk at them. I did uh, meet with the warehouse and longshoremen workers. Um, and um, with there's a lot of things that are happening as far as the wind energy projects and of course uh, Nordic's aquaculture project is uh, also on the uh, speed dial right now. So there's a lot going on in the Harbor District. For jobs, so unions are interested, that's good. Um, <clears throat> I'm overmaxed, but having fun. I'm very, very happy about the uh, momentum of the district and I feel I'm up to speed on the key decisions being made, but um, Oh, on June 18th, I'm hosting a meeting in Laytonville for all of Northern Mendocino on forest health, uh, riparian restoration, erosion control, and water conservation. And it's called Harmony Day because the Indians had it right. If you're good to nature, nature's going to reward you. You work against nature, nature's going to play tricks on you. So uh, forest health is the biggest of those issues because uh, the job's impending. Um, it's millions of dollars in reemployment in the Eel River Basin if we organize correctly. Uh, I've been monitoring in uh, Ten Mile Creek and around the Eel temperature, uh, more widely sediment and temperature in the, uh, and people can go to eelriverrecovery.org. I've got flow movies of every creek. I've got fresh fish movies. Juvenile Chinook all over the South Fork of the Eel and in Ten Mile and Laytonville. And they should know better. <laughs> uh, <laughs> whoops. That wasn't nice. But uh, there's a good standing crop of steelhead and rainbow trout. And after the driest, second driest year uh, on California record, um, nature's resilience is, uh, is really showing through. And so that's, that's a good thing. And I decided to take a day off today. So I probably worked harder than any other day recently. <laughs> Went out of the cove and jigged all day. If I start to spasm with my arms, <laughs> It's because I caught 40 or 50 rockfish today. <laughs> I have two lingcod on one cast, like probably 20 pounds worth of lingcod. And I, we do have a picture. The first picture is like the boat rocked and I thought I was going over the back. I should show you that one, you'd laugh. But the second one has, it's my lucky day grin. And uh, so Jake Mitchell and the Seahawk and his dad is a sidekick and the deck hand. And today I was out with Ed and the folks from Bear River. So I make, the most serendipitous acquaintances. 
And uh, I really liked their sense of humor. <laughs> Thank goodness it wasn't at my expense. Well, it was at the end of the day because I forgot my seasick pills. But uh, that's kind of my deal because I mean, the, the ocean is not my element, but Shelter Cove is magnificent. I stayed, uh, you know, in the tides in and uh, you're right there with the, with the crashing surf. And so, um, and the, Jake and the folks on board uh, and in the community are really, really grateful for us helping the sport fish restoration preservation group and, and the RIT to rise to the time and to take control of their destiny. And I think they're gonna do it. So it was fun being like, just kind of part of the community though, went to uh, the Jippo Ale Mill. It's like, it's a cultural island. It's, it's really cool. You can watch the sunset and have au cuisine. And uh, if you haven't been to Shelter Cove in a while, you need to go. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. But take your time driving there. Thank you, Greg. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm fat. Um, I'll, I'll close this up. I, I met um, remotely uh, with Emma Stokes and, and uh, the Redwood Region Core Hub, who are putting together a list of community benefits as, uh, as, uh, as the responsible party for our area with uh, offshore wind energy leases. Um, really interesting seeing what, they, what they've put together. They've done a really good job of concisely putting together all the, all the asks that, that would go into a community benefits package. Um, as part of the lease. And it's really, really uh, um, some things that I think make a, a huge difference. It's interesting that the, the lessor would be able to include that as up to 25% of the lease value. So um, I, I'm looking forward to seeing some of those things come to fruition with the, with the lease. And they're working with the the people that are, are bidding on the leases too, but uh, very uh, very well put together. And then Richard and I met with the Longshoremen, Richard and I and I guess the rest of the staff met with the Longshoremen, um, International Longshoremen's Union, Warehouse Union this week. And, and that was definitely interesting. They're, uh, they're very much involved in, in pursuing assistance for small ports, which we are still a small port. So that was kind of fun. Other than that, I don't have anything. I did not catch a fish today, Pat. So I'm jealous. And, or get a tan like I did. Or get a tan. You call like this a did. tan. <laughs> um, so we're done with commission and committee reports. Correspondence. Do we get any correspondence? Uh, no correspondence to report. Nobody writes us anymore? Just in this day and age of emails, almost everything is done with emails. Very good. No unfinished business, so we're going to skip item seven. We're going to move right into item eight, new business, preliminary budget adoption for fiscal year 22-23. So move. Second. I have a first and a second. Do you have a, you have a presentation? I do. Part? I have a presentation, and because um, – a lot of this is for the public uh, as well as the board because the board's been going through this. Uh, it's really been historically important to disclose all the district's finances and where, where we're at and what our plans are uh, for the, the public. And so um, go, go ahead to the next one, Mindy. And so the so just to go over a few highlights, I'm not going to go over all of these things, but basically um, our expenditures over the last year were within the budget and we're going to present to the board a balanced budget. That's always an important thing that we're not looking to cut anything from the preliminary budget. Our uh, budget is within balance. And a lot of that has to do with uh, we paid off some debt in this last year and the Coast Seafood. And so we uh, loan is fully repaid. I'm sorry. Uh, which is a huge, <laughs> huge accomplishment, something that we worked hard on getting and staff. Um, uh, and plus we got received the income from the RTI cable landing for the first uh, two cables. Um, and, uh, but we haven't received uh, the payments from the Nordic Aqua Farms because they haven't gotten the permits yet. 
Um, we're, it's not like they're behind or anything. It's just we're not including any rental payments in the Nordic Aqua Farms, which was something that we were going to count for because we're not going to count those funds until they actually get their permits and they're they're authorized to proceed. And so then what we're anticipating happening in the big picture is really is paying off the new market tax credit debts, which we received on the former pulp mill, the Redwood Marine Terminal One, when we acquired the property. And that really kickstarted the big renovation, which, which enabled us to attract the tenants and all of that, coupled with our partner, the EPA. But in March of 2023, then what we're anticipating is that uh, the new market tax credits is going to transfer that debt over to the Harbor District, and then the Harbor District will be in control of that asset and will no longer owe payments. Again, this is a huge accomplishment for us and is going to save us money. Um, we received $11 million of funds uh, for the offshore wind industry, and so that $11 million, we're anticipating that that's going to get budgeted over the three-year period, so you'll see some large expenditures in the budget associated with that. We also have a contract for $6 million with Caltrans for the Spartina eradication program. And that's gonna be spread over the next seven years of budgets. And so uh, these are really important things because what we've done with uh, our accountant, uh, Mark Witzel and what Mindy and I are working on is really is opening up, we're, we're looking at creating a new bank account so that we're making sure that we're keeping those funds segregated and completely separate from uh, some of the regular Harbor District's money and how we report to the board you know, our available cash. So we're not over presenting the amount of cash that we have because all of these are commitments that we have to expend and they're long-term commitments. And so we're really working on setting up the structure within the budget on how we report those because we're anticipating that this is just the start and that we're gonna start to see a lot more of these funds rolling into the district. And we have to keep our accounting top notch. That's one of the cornerstones of what uh, our administrative policy is, is keeping our books in order. And so in addition to that, we received an additional $900,000 from the Smota Beautification Project, which is on your agenda tonight. And uh, over the last year, we, we removed a bunch of hazardous materials from Redwood Marine Terminal 2, Fields Landing Boatyard, uh, by, and also included abandoning a couple of uh, commercial vessels, which Chris reported on in his uh, staff report. And so the preliminary reserve uh, balances are really something that the public has been interested in and something that we've been working on for a long time, and that there's currently approximately $1 million in the dredge fund uh, balance. That's the cash that we have on hand uh, that we've been collecting from Woodley Island Marina and the Fields Landing Boatyard. And there's an additional approximately 550,000 in the flow replacement fund and $400,000 in the, what we call the general reserve account. And so included in your packet is the, uh, there's a, uh, a budget and uh, I forget the exact name of it, but it is, it's basically the budget and reserve policies. And there are also policies on debt service. And so within that document, there, the following statement is included in there, which uh, that our goal is to maintain at least 20% of our operating expenditures in uh, the general fund reserve fund. And so just as an example, if we have $2 million worth of operating expenditures in the budget, then we should have 400,000 in the reserve fund. And that's because we, we need to maintain those monies for cash flow purposes, and also, as we always see, there's some emergency that comes up that we have to deal with, and we need to, may need to dip into those reserves, or if there's, uh, heaven forbid, there's another pandemic or other crisis. These are the things that help us to weather that storm by having these reserve funds, and that we really need to make sure that we, we maintain these balances and keep an accurate accounting of those funds. And so the district's cash flow is manageable at this point. Uh, it's pretty amazing when uh, when I, I started with the district and the board and we really set out to chart this pathway um, at the staff level, we were really having some significant cash flow problems. And at this point, um, our cash flow is manageable and it's largely because we've been able to build up these reserve funds and the staff has been very, very disciplined in how we manage our contracts and how we manage the district's district's money. And we intend to stay within those policies and to live within our, our means. But at the same time, as we'll discuss later on, it's critically important that 
we're going to need to, uh, to, to dredge and that we're very likely going to need to borrow some additional money in order to dredge in this, this, uh, this next uh, funding cycle. And so within the preliminary budget, what the budget that I'm presenting to you, you'll see that there are no expenditures in the budget for, for dredging this year. That's something that we're going to have to address and look at over the course of time. I'm not gonna go over all of this, but this is really kind of a synthesized packet without all the sub line items. These are just the main categories of the income expenditures where you can see with the grant funds in the grant categories, this year we're proposing to, uh, to utilize of all the grant funds that I was showing you that we've received that we're gonna spread over time. This year, we're proposing to have about $2.7 million uh, worth of uh, these grant expenditures in income, and there's a corresponding expenditure with those. But our total income we're projecting is approximately $6,854,000. Uh, Within the uh, expenditure line items, and this is getting smaller and smaller as I get older and older, uh, but again, this is kind of a compressed of what you have in your packet, which is just the main headings. And so again, the corresponding 2.7 million of grant fund expenditures that matches up with the income, and we're proposing to expend uh, $6,047,000 through the preliminary budget. And so, you know, just the way the accounting works is the debt services aren't counted as an expenditure. And so then these are the debt services that we have. We have bond payments, which were from the original Woodley Island Marina construction. And then also when the district did the Harbor Deepening Project, that's what these funds are. These are the debt service payments from Woodley Island Marina and the Harbor Deepening Project. And then the BVVA loan, this is what I was discussing about the new market tax credit that we're getting ready to pay off. This is the expenditures that we have on the new market tax credit. And then you often hear this with, almost every jurisdiction, there's this CalPERS unfunded liability. And it's a major, major issue. And uh, it's uh, the district this year will be expending $102,000 on this. That's above and beyond the normal payments that we make each month to CalPERS to cover all the staff's expenditures, just because of the, uh, the rise and fall in the market and, ex and et cetera, to cover the unfunded liabilities that, that overall that CalPERS has. And total, uh, Mindy, how much is our total? I'm, I'm putting you on the spot. Uh, yeah, our total, we, we could report back at another time on what our total unfunded liability is uh, for the, the CalPERS. Um, but then within these is then we're also within the accounting, these are the deposits that we make into the reserve accounts. And at this point, because we're not proposing to have any expenditures out of the dredge fund, the dredge surcharge, we're anticipating 200,000 of income, we're proposing to deposit that right into the dredge fund. And then we are making some expenditures out of the float replacement. There's 60,000 of income, and we're proposing to expend or deposit additional approximately 35,000 into the float replacement fund, and 15,000 would come from the fields landing boat yard. And so there's an accounting of kind of where we're coming up with these projections uh, of our, re our reserve funds. Uh, and um, overall, staff's recommendation is that we adopt the preliminary budget, because this is required by law that we have to adopt the preliminary budget by June 30th. And then what our intention is, is to bring back the final budget uh, in uh, the, your July meeting for adoption. So I'm available for any questions that you may have. Do you have any questions for? First, I'd like to make a comment. This is light years around the, above the budget in 2008, 2010. It was very difficult to understand. It didn't fully convey it to the public. Uh, oftentimes it was like um, high siding. Uh, and I really like your pregmatic approach to um, no, you know, don't catch your chickens before they're hatched. That's, that's a good sound fiscal policy. And so I, I like that because I think that these numbers are real and it reflects the, the district's vastly improved condition. But there is one thing, Larry, and that is we got a dredge, a suction dredge we'll never use 
it's worth enough to do the dredging and buy a new dredge. Can we juggle that in this year? I'm not saying we need to shove it into the budget, but I, I do see that that asset, which is desired by some, could be a substantial chunk of change and bring revenue to pay for the dredging in lieu of, maybe not in lieu of, but to offset whatever we needed to borrow. So just something kicking around and the recesses of my mind. I think Aaron Newman has strong interest in this as well. I don't know if that dredging with the island is a uh, jet line for the opportunity. Um, yeah, that will, I wanted to go into more, a little bit more detail on the dredging, but at this juncture, we're not including- any Let's put it on a meeting. Let's, let's, let's give it the, what it's due. It's, yeah, it's on later on the agenda. Okay, sorry. My comment wasn't really gonna be about dredging, although as Commissioner Higgins said, I'm very concerned. Uh, noticing those reserve funds and the, the amount of monies in it and having taken on the role of fire boat liaison, I would be interested in finding out how difficult it would be for the district's emergency response vehicle to be able to tap into those funds. That's uh, becoming very important to me and the other people involved with the fire boat that we can take care of things in a timely fashion and uh, just keep that thing like a fire truck, ready to go. And uh, I just wonder if there's a way we can work the fire boat into those items as far as uh, being able to access those emergency phones. That's just the comment. I'm so, I don't, uh, and I'm going to put you on the spot here, Chris. Do you, within when we went over the the, the vessel maintenance, what what are we proposing to do th this year's budget with the vessel? Fire So what I was kind of looking at was the float replacement money or, or whatever, if uh, that can be designated somehow that if we need something right away, we can just tap into those funds for that emergency response vehicle. That's something I, I don't know what the uh, the pathway is to get that as part of the of the budget or whatever, but uh, just wanted to mention that as a possibility. Thank you, Commissioner Newen. Commissioner Coleman, any any comments on the budget? On your budget? Um, no specific comments. I also appreciate the clarity in which it was presented uh, and am eagerly anticipating the discussion on dredging later in the agenda because I do hate to hear like, oh, we're not allocating funds and dredging this year, but I know that doesn't mean that we're not planning on, I hope that doesn't mean that we're not planning on doing any dredging, but we'll, I guess we'll get to that in that item. But otherwise, uh, yeah, I appreciate it. It's nice to hear that we have a balanced budget. Uh, it's the, you know, the coast seafood paid off uh, is huge. Bringing, starting to see some income from RMT2, you know, that uh, harebrained idea of the board. It looks like it's bearing fruit in addition to it not having completely environmentally destroyed the bay. Uh, so. Congrats and kudos to all of you who are on the board at that time when that decision was made. And it's too bad about the, you know, that we're gonna have to wait a little longer to start seeing some income from the Nordic project, but that's hopefully on the horizon as well. So thank you. Good things come to those who wait. Does that, does that make yeah. sense? Something comes to those who wait. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Pat doesn't want to count his chickens before they hatch, but you know, you, you can't make an omelet without breaking all of your eggs in one basket. Or something. <laughs> so, you have to break all of them. But all of them. Break all your all, eggs. Yeah, yeah. Well, we've been doing that for a long time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so thanks, Larry. I thought I uh Larry and, and Mindy, that that was uh refreshing. It's nice to see that. There's that much thought going into where we're going and what we're doing and, and partitioning off some of these funds, I think is important. We get asked that frequently. 
Um, how much do we have in the dredge fund? How much do we have in the float replacement fund? We're paying into these funds. Does that just disappear into the general fund, which it does and it doesn't, but some sort of fund that's partitioning those. Um, the fire boat. I know this is not on the agenda, but the, are there other sources of, of income or, because I, I know fire trucks get paid for out of the city. Is that where the, all their money comes from? The city or where, how do they fund, how do they pay for new fire trucks or maintaining fire trucks? Well, most we had, go ahead. I was going to say, well, yeah, you would probably represent 14 different fire districts. So <laughs> just go ahead. Yeah. Most of it comes from benefit assessments and real property taxes. Um, but a lot of equipment upgrades to fire trucks is grant funded. Grant funded. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, that's how we got the fire boat in the first place was a grant. Yeah. yeah. Um, are there grants out there for fire boats? The, within the, um, there are, you know, not specific to fire boats, but just as an example, we were currently reviewing earlier this year when we applied for like the safe grant out of the boating and waterways, they had a uh, uh, one that other vessels could be eligible expenses. And so it really is kind of looking and itemizing what those those areas are. You know, there's there's within the fire boat and um, what the one that I keep hearing all the time is, uh, you know, number one, fuel prices are going up and we budget for fuel. And so really the, the ability to go out and do the training over and over and over again and not exceeding your, your uh, the fuels uh, is sort of first and foremost. Yeah. I mean, you get into the bare bones minimum. I was listening to the news this morning and they were talking about police departments and fire departments that are already over their fuels budget because it's, it's expensive uh, and it's expensive to, to run that fire boat. And so really just making sure there's adequate operating funds in the first place. And then um, I believe in this last year that the, uh, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, but the fire department was able to provide some, uh, some of the hoses and some of the other equipment that we didn't need to purchase or expend. They basically replaced a lot of those uh, assets that are on there. And so it's not like there's not a cooperative relationship. We work kind of together on some of these things. Um, but I think overall within the grant world, it takes money to make money. And part of our issue is we were so tight that normally it, there's matching funds that's required in oh, order yeah. to apply for the funds where we're finally at the point where we can start to apply for some of these funds because we have the cash flow. And so over the course of the next year, we'll keep an eye on the fire boat and all other grant funding opportunities. And most likely we'll come to you with some sort of a grant application and say, look, we might need, you know, $10,000 of a certain fund in order to leverage $100,000 of additional funds or something to that nature. Perfect. Thanks, Larry. I, one of the, that, that fire boat is an asset that, I mean, if it only takes a very, very brief period of, of not taking care of it and it will be junk and we don't want that to happen and this thing has already saved quite a bit of infrastructure yes. around the shores of the bay and we're going to have it and i kind of poo-pooed it because i didn't like the fact that it was tied to national security but it's imperative to the security of the bay well we're going to have a pretty expensive dock that's going to have a lot of expensive equipment on it that's going to want to have a fireboat and the fireboat's a 10 year old aluminum boat it's going to need some significant maintenance and maybe not with a lot of warning. So that's why I brought it up. Yeah. Should we take it Thanks. somewhere and run it in fresh water every once in a while? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we've got it. We 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 have uh, we haven't voted on this. We right. Don't. But we do have a motion and a second. It was yeah. Do we, we need to change that, Richard, Ryan? Richard seconded. Okay. So let's take it to the take it to the public. Is there anyone from the public that would like to comment on our preliminary budget adoption for 22-23? Please signify by raising your hand, speaking out. Seeing none, Larry? Uh, Commissioner Higgins? Yes. Commissioner Newman? Yes. Commissioner Cullen? Yes. And President Dale? Yes. All right, move on to item B. 
8B, consider adopting resolution 22-05, resolution of the Board of Commissioners of the Humble Bay Harbor Recreation and Conservation District, authorizing the executive director to execute a grant agreement with the California Department of Transportation, accepting a clean California grant. So move. I have a motion and a second. Any, any uh, report? Uh, I have no report unless you. Um, yeah, this is this is essentially discussion. Caltrans mitigation for the highway around hum Humboldt Bay, and it's a great deal. Uh, the WIAT uh, get an opportunity. RCAA uh, is in the mix for suppression of Spartina. We are rewarded sufficiently for uh, administration. Patrick, did I get that wrong? You're talking about a different grant. Yeah, this is. Uh oh. Different. Just to clarify, we uh, submitted a grant application to. Uh, Cal Department of Transportation, the Clean California Local uh, Grant Program. And this is for improvements for the Samoa Peninsula uh, for beautification that we're doing in tandem. And you're correct, Pat, oh, with the uh, Community Action Agency. Sorry. No, you're, you're, you're correct. We're working with RCAA. And so we've brought this to you, letting you know that we we're going to apply for the grant in partnership with RCAA. Uh, we came back and showed the application. And now we simply need to have a resolution that would allow us to accept and enter into the grant agreement uh, and begin the process. And so um, with that, we'll begin um, in July. Thank you. Wow. So uh, we have another comments no. from the board. Okay. Any comments from the public? Seeing none, we'll move on to a vote, Larry. Commissioner Higgins? Yes. Commissioner Newman? Yes. Commissioner Coleman? Yes. President Dale? Yes. We'll move into 8C, update on the Woodley Island Marina dredging plans and provide direction as appropriate. Can you put that back on the knee, please? So the, uh, you know, the, especially at, at low tides, you know, it's a sight to see where you can see standing mud and the boats actually sitting um, on uh, just bare mud right in the, the bay. It really puts it to light when you hear uh, the commercial fishermen, sailboat operators, recreational boaters, you look out uh, in the marina when there's water in there and you'll see a sailboat that'll be you know, stuck in the water because the, the, the keel's there. Um, the Woodley Island Marina needs to be uh, dredged. Um, it's, a, it's a common problem. It's not, we're not unique to it. The city of Eureka you know, just dredged a couple of years ago and you know, they're already starting to talk about needing to dredge again uh, as well. And they did a, an extensive uh, dredging cycle. It just kind of is the nature of the beast with uh, when you operate a marina. Um, but at this point, it's really getting out of hand uh, at Woodley Island uh, Marina. And so we have to do something with it. Basically, as we discussed in the budget uh, standpoint is, you know, here's really <coughs> how much cash that we have on hand. We currently are not budgeting anything and that we uh, might need to, uh, we're definitely gonna have to use the, uh, the dredge fund balances because that's what they're there for. But we may have to tap into some of these other reserve uh, funds as well in order to do uh, the dredging because we just simply don't have enough money and we're likely gonna to need to borrow some money. So we have all the permits to dredge Woodley Island Marina with a clamshell uh, for a 10 year period. The dredge window is between July 15th, October 15th, but the maximum that we can take out of the marina is 100,000 cubic yards in a year. And that's partially because of the way that we have permits and the way that the Coastal Act is set up, is if you do less than 100,000 cubic yards a year, it's considered maintenance. If you do more than 100,000 cubic year yards, it's a totally different permit uh, process that you go to. And so our permits are all limited to 100,000 cubic yards a year, but we could do up to 300,000 over a 10 year period. We estimate that there's between 10 to 15,000 that of material that accumulates each year. And so if we were basically going to 
do um, 100,000 cubic yards, uh, the last two times that we dredged, the, they came in at about $25 a cubic yard, uh, plus the mobilization cost to bring in you know, the clamshell. At this point, I think it's unrealistic, uh, even though we're still working on it, we, we don't have the permits to do the suction dredge, and we don't have the permits to use uh, the small lagoons. I mean, we're always hopeful, but I've been here now, I think about five years, and I've been hopeful for a, a long time. Um, and so I think realistically, if we're going to dredge, we're likely going to have to use the clamshell uh, dredge again, because we won't have permits in time to do it. You know, the preliminary costs are in the range to do 100,000 cubic yards with the mobilization and the other costs associated with using it going to hoods. It'll probably be in the range of about three to three point seven million dollars. And so therefore, with the reserve funds that we have, we're probably going to need to rent to borrow somewhere in the range of two to two and a half million dollars of a borrowing that we're going to have to do. And per the policy that was in your packet, what one of the most important things uh, when you borrow money, you don't want to borrow money for longer than the useful life of the asset that you invested the borrowed funds in. And so therefore, you should not borrow for more than a 10-year term for dredging because you're going to need to redredge over and over and over again. Otherwise, you just get into these cycles where you just get farther and farther and farther in the hole with debt service um, over time. It'll just end up killing the district. If You're you... paying for interest instead of services. Mm -hmm. And so um, the reality is we've been meeting as a staff for quite a bit, and we feel like we have a fairly good idea on the dredging. Um, we're um, you know, you know me, I'm a spreadsheet person. I've got this all analyzed. And so really Rob is working on certain components of this. Chris is working on components. We've been meeting with uh, people at the state and other places about what are the best ways that we might be able to borrow money and under what are the best terms that we might be able to borrow uh, the funds. And so we're, we're not anticipating dredging this year. And there's, uh, in the first place is because it'll take us longer than that to get the money to dredge. And our window is only July 15th to October 15th. And even if we went out to bid right now, by the time we awarded the contract, we would run out of time and we just wouldn't be able to do it. Um, secondarily, preliminary, the res, res, uh, preliminary information that I've gotten from other dredging that's happening around, fuel prices are just killing uh, the dredging world uh, because it's, totally impacting the tugs, the excavators, you know, cranes. These are labor intensive projects that use lots of fuel. And, you know, right now the cost that I gave you, they would be significantly higher if we went out to bid today because of the, the primarily associated with the fuel prices. Um, and just sta the, the standard CPI uh, that's happening for all across the, the segments. And so, um, what we're looking at is analyzing loan packages and our financing uh, situation for our to the total needs of the district and really planning to come back and dredge next fiscal year uh, between in the July 15th to October 15th uh, cycle. And um, it's, I know it's going to be another you know, bad year, but that's just the reality of the situation at this point. Um, we, the marina will be uh, surveyed. We'll have a survey of the marina within the, the next two, three weeks. Uh, they're going to be here, I think, within the next two to three weeks. Um, and we should get the results of the, the, the survey. In other words, we'll be able to take a look at the details and then come up with the estimates and then where are the priority dredging areas uh, so we can plan out the dredging of where we're going to take the 100,000 cubic yards out and really start to lay out uh, we already have the RFPs that we did from the previous years, and so it won't be that difficult to put together the overall package. Um, but that's kind of is the sad news that I am, am doing. And the last thing uh, is that um, within the numbers that we have is uh, we previously went to the board and to sell the dredge is absolutely what uh, the, the Nehalem uh, is to sell the, the Nehalem is that's definitely in the, in the plans. Uh, that we so have. what's that worth, Larry, if you had a crystal ball? 
Uh, you know, 400 I'm, grand or something, 500. I was sitting worth here uh, live. If anybody's listening, I think it's worth about five million. That uh, no, uh, uh, I'll tell you offline, but uh, because yeah. this is all part of a negotiation. Yeah, and, uh, and it's like if they really need it, then the halo has been well maintained, and it actually, you know, the the whole package we've we've used it quite a bit. But um, could I go great? So I just kind of jumped right on the pony there. Yeah, make it quick. All right, there we go. Huh? Is this just in neglected areas when we're seeing that the, those photos are very, very dramatic and useful? Is those the, are those the areas we didn't dredge before? And if we just hit those, are we, you know, are the other areas going to deteriorate so fast that the other fingers are going to have boats in the mud? So is the 100,000 necessary both to maintain our gains as well as to catch up in those other areas? Your comment? Your boat's stuck in the mud sometimes. Yeah, I'd say that from my understanding, and, and, and I don't know about all the fingers, but somewhere around 80% of the marina right now, I would think is compromised by the need to be dredged. Yeah, and some and some more critically, and, and some uh, kind of, if you let it go another couple of years, then you're going to have the problem back. We're overdue by like four or five years. Okay. Just seems like yesterday to me. Yeah. 2007 <laughs> was the last time, if I remember right. Ten-year cycle. So, Larry, if we did 50,000 cubic yards instead of 100, is it like 150% on the cost factor because the 100,000 cubic yards makes it wash at 3.2? 3, 3 if we did, like, just the emergency stuff? Well, the what we really want to do is, um, in, the, in the first place, is the... the the mobilization costs kill you right off the bat. And so because you you pay the mobilization costs, whether you do one yard or you do 100,000 right. cubic yards. So that answers my question. The more cubic yards you do, yeah. the lower your overall cost. The, the second strategy is what we'd like to do is to partner with and time our dredging event with either the city of Eureka or, or one of the other people that need to dredge their areas. So then we can share the mobilization costs and get more cubic yards. In the past, that's what the Harbor District did when we dredged and we went onto the beach, the last time that they dredged in uh, the the between the marina and all of the city of Eureka's facilities, it was I, my memory is this was approximately two hundred and twenty eight thousand cubic yards, and they because we partnered with the city of Eureka and we shared the mobilization costs, and because we instead of dredging one hundred thousand cubic yards, then you might do one hundred and fifty thousand or whatever Eureka needs. And then we make it more competitive, not only with the mobilization costs, but hopefully lower the cubic yard costs uh, down as well. And so that's part of the strategy that we're looking at and we wanna bring back to you is a number of different ways that we can try to bring down the costs of the, of the dredging. Uh, but the reality is that uh, what we've said many times before is the dredge uh, surcharge, although it's extremely, extremely important, it does not cover the cost of dredging. Um, and then number number two is the you know the harbor district just even though we're putting in additional money beyond the dredge surcharge we we just don't have the cash at this point to do it and the backlog is is just so great that we're going to have to borrow. Well, and it's fifteen funds. years of of dredge funds at the two hundred thousand dollar number or sixteen or seventeen. So you know this is. I know it's a bad time, but we should be dredging Eureka's Harbor. We should basically get into this game because every time we pay this giant amount of money and we don't put it into infrastructure and take control of this game with our staff, we lose. And so, but my frustration on this issue is such that I should just camp on what else I'm thinking because we have been impeded at every turn in terms of regulation, which doesn't serve the tenants of the harbor, the tenants of Eureka, or the citizens of the region. And to go to a suction dredge with the waterhead instead of uh, the cutterhead um, is environmentally benign. And as long as we stay with the, the, the bucket dredge, it's stirring up the sediment, it's stirring up pollution. It's the most, it's the dirtiest way, but we're permitted to do it. So 
thank you for letting me express my frustration. I, I'd have to say that I'm, we're going to need a committee on this because it's a lot of money. And um, speaking of, would you like to, would you like to volunteer for that committee? Um, yeah, I believe the committee is. Yeah, I Commissioner think I'm on Williams it. And Commissioner yeah. Yeah, yeah, there is a committee. So why don't, why, don't you get, why don't you meet and, and uh, solve this? Solve this, figure this out. So, and can just, uh, you know, with saying that we want to do 100,000, how much have we done in previous years, just in comparison? Um, you know, I don't, re re off the top of my head, I don't remember exactly what we did. The, the, in 2019, um, we had Dutra come in. And they basically did the end ties. Yeah. And then uh, the essentially the same year as we did that, we were able to get the Army Corps of Engineers to, to the Uquina to come in to dredge the inner channel uh, mm -hmm. and to really help some of the issues that we had right at the end ties. And they came in as close as they could, which really helped us too. And then in 2020, uh, we had another dredging event, the Figus, and that was a, about 7,800 yards, cubic yards. And that was the beneficial reuse that Chris had just, that we uh, dewatered and transferred it over. Yeah, uh, which proves we can do that. Like, yeah, what, mm -hmm. what the scale of that was, uh, it was about 7,800 from yep. what Figus did. Yep. Yeah. Please, Mr. Newman. And I guess you won't really know the extent of what needs to be removed until the survey's done. And then we'll have an idea next month or so yeah we by the we should by the we'll plan to have a dread subcommittee you know as soon as we get the dread survey results and we we do a quick internal analysis then we'll form the dread subcommittee and we'll go over those and we'll we've been working on it and, I, and we'll present kind of what we, our plan is um and how we might be able to pay for this i'd be uh i wouldn't be surprised if it's over a hundred thousand yards just to get caught up but we can't do more than 100,000 because of our permit. And that's in one, year. In, in one year. in one year. Mm -hmm. In one year. You put a lot of thought into this. I appreciate that. Yep, I agree. So that's just an update. Thanks for the update. I think uh, once you deem it appropriate, we'll put these two guys in the room with the rest of you. And then and we'll, God we'll do a you. workshop. Maybe the whole... All right, moving on. Oh, any public comment on that? I'd love to hear somebody speak on our dredge report, Woodland Island dredging report. Seeing none. The Army Corps and the benefits of like when the sediment in the channel moves out because they dug it deeper, I think because our mud becomes consolidated over time, we're not getting full benefit of kind of the fluid, usually silt is gonna move with water. And if the Army Corps dredges the channel, then the silt should flatten in a profile heading towards shore and downcut and solve this problem, but it's not. And I think that's because as the sediment stays embedded or gets embedded over time, it becomes, you know, like clay. And so when we dredge, maybe it'll become fluid and, and have some more self-maintaining benefit from the Army Corps. That's hypothesis great. There's a lot of Thank vegetation you. on it too that holds it together on the surface, which causes it to not do that. But okay, I'm gonna move on to item 8D. Um, receive a report on the changes to customs and border protection operations at the port of Eureka, port of entry. Eureka, port of entry. That were recently announced by the US Department of Homeland Security. This, this has happened before, right, Larry? Uh, to my knowledge, uh, no, that- um, They've threatened to do this before. That they've threatened to do it in the past, but this is, they actually have done that. And so then, what I wanted to kind of highlight here is, can't see this. Andy, can you put that on the full screen? Is, uh, So the, in, in your packet is basically this, this is an excerpt from the, the letter that they sent us. And they said, you know, basically effective the May 2nd is that the Eureka port of entry is no longer staffed. And what I wanted to highlight here is really example of the services that they include is these vessel entry and clearance, 
crew inspection, collecting fees, these kinds of things. These are really benign things. And most people never pay any attention to them, but they're critically important when you operate a port. And within the Coast Guard, you know, down here it says they operate over 300 of these on air, land, and sea. And it's hard to have a port if you do not have uh, uh, customs. You know, this is the Coast Guard, or I'm sorry, the, their, uh, their website. I took this off today, you know, the Eureka Port of Entry. Um, you know, this is where they're instructing people to come in. You look into the Harbor District and it says, you know, what are the services, immigration, agricultural inspection, you know, foreign vessels that come in. When Green Diamond brings a ship in and it's coming from uh, Korea and it has a Korean crew, <laughs> the customs has to go on board and verify the, the crew before any th activity that can take place on the ships. And right now, what uh, because we don't have anybody here in Humboldt because they closed it down, what we're supposed to do is we're supposed to call the San Francisco office. And then when the ship comes into port, then they might send somebody up here and then they would then verify the, that they meet all the criteria. And then you could begin the unloading process. That's just really not practical for operating a port. Um, because we all know, you know, I send out the relay, the information on the ships. And in the first place is that, you know, I'll send you out something and say, the ship is scheduled to come next Tuesday. And then I'll send another one and say, oh, it's going to come next Thursday or Friday is you don't know exactly when they're going to be there and you can't pre-plan in advance. And then the ships can't so wait. So it's a false economy. You can't wait a couple of days or more for the customs to come here before you can begin these operations. And so it's not just uh, the Harbor District that this is important for. It's also important for when we're doing cruise ships and we're doing our cruise ship planning and with the city of Eureka and the city of Eureka partners with the airport. And when the, the airport, if anything's coming in from a foreign country, you know, from an airport, um, if you're uh, a sailing vessel, you're a recreational sailing vessel, and you're sailing from overseas and you come into the port, you have to register with the customs office to go in in order to do. Um, there's a whole lot of activity that happens within customs that we just don't even think about on a daily basis. And then when you look at our efforts to build a brand new heavy lift marine terminal, all the activity that we have, there's really is looking at this from the short-term impact and also the long-term is that we need to develop a strategy working with, in my opinion, we need to work with the county, the city of Eureka and our congressmen and representatives to really emphasize the need that we need to have customs uh, uh, port of entry in Humboldt, working with uh, Green Diamond and the other agencies that rely on these services um, and not wave our hands and scream, but we need to, get a strategy to regain the services that we just lost and then plan to have increased services as our new terminals come online and we get this additional um, services that we have because these uh, customs and border uh, are just really critical to our operations as a port. Yeah. Uh, my understanding is with the heavy shipping is probably coordinated via the shipping agent. And this is Leroy from mm -hmm. CNC Marine Services. Now I know in the fishing industry, there's, there's foreign crews on vessels here that are supposed to be supervised by local customs authorities. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't understand how that can be possible if there's not a local presence. That's another aspect is that we have people that live on the vessels here in Woodley Island, and then they go out to fish and they're born, uh, but they're authorized to be here because they've been inspected. And every time they come back into port, you have to recertify. So it affects the commercial fishing industry and a whole variety of different industries. And I, I, I just know that a lot of the activities that, that these foreign crew folks are allowed to do are kind of... Uh, under the guise of local jurisdiction as far as customs being the overseer. And I, I can't imagine it's not a, 
somewhat chaotic situation if we don't have anyone within 200 miles to take care of that. So this, this is a big deal for more than just, more than just shipping. Eureka used to be famous for what came in at night. Um, but what I see here is that we had success in getting the Army Corps to hear us. And uh, Greg Dale, I would like to personally commend. Um, this is a big issue for Leroy Zerlang, who's on the Humboldt Bay Harbor, or the, the Economic Development Committee, and so if we form a committee to deal with this, I would highly recommend that it would include Leroy if we get that formal. And then also, you know, City of Eureka. And uh, one of the reasons we've succeeded in lobbying the Army Corps is because of Green Diamond. And the irony of this is not lost uh, on me. And that is that like, so we get more shipping traffic, we get better dredging, uh, we get more motivated private partners and then they're stalled around losing money because we don't have customs. So, I mean, this is, and, and, and it's going to get really, really busy. So all of a sudden, the amount of business we're doing is no longer good news. It's like, oh, well, then we won't be able to do this because we just don't have the customs people. And I do believe it's a false economy. I don't think shipping people here from San Francisco with gas at six seventy nine a gallon or jumping on an airplane, even if you get bulk rates, is either environmentally conscious or a good strategy for the agency. So, um, you know, what happens in these cases is that you get some economists sitting somewhere kind of going, okay, we've got to cut the budget because somebody on a committee said you got to cut the budget. Next thing you know, you're cutting us. They tried to do this with the Coast Guard on us several times. We have to remain eternally vigilant. Without the Coast Guard, you know, it's just like that's the safety net. So, um, I'm cranked up on this issue, but I don't think I have much political juice. So I would defer on committee service in this regard, but I do think we should take some action to, because Leroy was very excited about this at the Humboldt Bay Economic Development Association meeting. He sees it as a catastrophe. Aaron? I really feel it's important that we get into this. It's like our situation with our, our bar pilots. We, we need to um, get ahead of it. So formation of a committee is something we need to do. I would uh, definitely be willing to be involved in that. Greg. <laughs> I like how you brought it up that it is analogous to what happened with the Army Corps. And I think we were very successful in being able to lobby them and get them out here to meet with us and express our needs. And so, I don't know if that warrant if that had a committee attached to it or not. But I, I would say something along those same lines. So talking with our uh, congressman and figuring out who who we need to lobby, who we need to get here. Uh, you know, getting that big letter with a hundred signatures on it, and I think you know being able to act on that. And see if anybody making decisions lives in San Francisco, for instance, which isn't that far. I mean, to bet, you know, if they won't come here, which is what we want them to do, but then we should go there and talk to whoever's in charge because somebody's back in the bureaucracy. They need to meet the public. Well, you guys all done? Sure. So I, I, I know it sounds, it's, and I, I remember this conversation. I don't know. It's, it's happened several times that they've threatened to, to do this, especially when our shipping gets to a point where it's just not fiscally or or the, it's just not needed. When you have six ships a year, you don't need to have somebody live here full time to do to do this job. And they can. And my understanding is they could adequately supervise and supervise crews and service inbound outbound ships with with uh, out of town uh, staff and so it ultimately didn't affect the shipping or the or the activities that occur here I don't know that that's true I, that's what I remember from previous, conversations or threats about this. I think we need to get our ducks in a row before we get, um, we start slinging, slinging lead. That's always important. Um, 
and I and I you know I, I'd love to see I happen to enjoy the customs officers that we've had here um and so I hate the fact that they take my parking spot when I want to park in their parking spot well that does this if they if they remove this position does that mean that that parking spot will no longer be reserved for customs only <laughs> um this is a major issue for the district break I know so let's. I think uh, this is self-interest. Let's let's let's. Uh, um, can we put this on our on our agenda with the dredge committee? And and make yeah, I think we get we get assimilate that. I, I think you need to hear from Leroy right here in this room. Not dredge committee. Uh, with our pilot. pilot committee. Um, Speaking the same. Yeah, let, let, and then uh, make a few phone calls and find out. I, I think uh, a phone call to to um, Congressman Huffman's office is probably in order and let him figure out, let his staff figure out exactly um, what the situation is. Um, and then, then we'll know, well, the facts. Um, but yeah, no, I, I agree with, I, I agree with everything I said. If it in fact does um, cause hardship to any of our shippers or our fishermen, then it's something we need to we need to um, we need to address. If in fact they can provide adequate service and save the, the federal government money, um, then I'm I'm fine with that as well. We just have to have the service, right? So, any, so. any other comments from the board before I take it to the public? I would like. Anybody that wishes to comment on the Customs and Border Protection operations at the Port of Eureka, please speak up if you have something to say to the public. It's quiet public tonight, Mindy. So we're going to move on. Another report. The sea also rises. The sea is rising. Grand jury is telling us what to do. But the next part of that phrase is, and the sun goeth down. I don't think it's going to recede. <laughs> yeah, so within, the, I'm not going to go over all of this, but the, the grand jury issued a report uh, to us. We have uh, 90 days from the date of issuance to provide a, uh, a response. And so in at the, uh, at the end of the day, these are the two responses, the R's, you know, that we're supposed to re respond to. Um, I don't think it will be that that difficult uh, for us to do. We've been actively working on sea level rise and coordinating with the county of Humboldt, the city of Eureka, city of Arcata, um, Caltrans, and a whole variety of different jurisdictions. And so uh, the discussions that we've had internally are to, to meet with them and to kind of coordinate our responses a little bit uh, mm -hmm. with them, um, because I think we've all been working together and I think we're all planning to continue to work uh, together on this issue. And so I was just bringing this to as an informational item, really for the board and the public that we did uh, receive this. And our intention is to provide the response within the 90 day period. Thank you. Any comments from the board? I think it was 2014 at uh, one of our humble base symposiums when a gentleman talked about how to reseed the shore and to, you know, climate ad adaptation. And it occurred to me that we were in the best position to possibly lead such a venture. And then enormously useful studies have gone on with different collaborations between government and uh, also uh, academia. And I think some of them have been grant funded. So that tends to move us forward as we collaborate on those specific studies. And then those things go on the shelf. And I think this is actually a good idea. Climate change is not going away. It tends to drift from the center of the agenda when we don't have these active studies going on. And it's really something that huge resources available if we're organized. And so I, I believe that um, this should be an important issue for us. And in a way, the, the grand jury has done us a favor by kind of forcing this back onto the agenda of not just our agenda, but all our collaborators. So I think it's fruitful that this is, you know, they put this pressure on and uh, they do an awful lot of work for nothing. 
and I respect it a great deal. Well, uh, a grand jury member over here. Well, well, I agree with Commissioner Higgins, and I would uh, just like to thank the members of the grand jury, the civil grand jury in Humboldt County, as I was a member in 1718, and thank you very much for the pretty unappreciated work that they do. Stephen, any comments? You're, you're claiming you were a grand jury member in 1718? Some kind of vampire or something? Yeah. Uh, uh, no, I, I'm, I think this is obviously a hugely important topic and an essential thing for us as Harbor Commissioners to address. I mean, there is with the, you know, sea level rise and the increase in storm surges and all that. We have so much infrastructure in the path of that. We have so much decaying uh, armor around the bay that you know won't do anything to hold back rising seas. And we have so many potential contaminants, including uh, nuclear material that's within the path of rising seas that could very easily end up in our waters if we don't address it. And a dike system built in 1870 or something that's been maintained patchwork owned by mostly senior agricultural people. Uh, that was the, uh, the crumbling infrastructure, uh, armored infrastructure. I so, no, but I mean, but the thing is, my point here is that they're not really prepared to deal with this issue independently. No, they're, they're small I services think, districts no, for different parts of the dike. So it's an infrastructure problem in terms of the bureaucratic end of it. Well, I think we all agree it's important. We need to do something about it. Agreed. Um, so, and I'll, I'll, I'll uh, so I, I, I during, God, it seems like it was yesterday, but it was during COVID. It was probably a year ago. I, I Are spoke we done with, with COVID. Well, we're done with the 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 oppressive um, nature of COVID. We're back to meeting in person. Yeah. You're not wearing a mask. No. I've gotten COVID. You probably have gotten COVID. Um, I've gotten 25 different shots, so I, I feel like I'm done with COVID. Okay. Uh, sir's health. Feel like I'm done with COVID. <laughs> I just got my second vax. Um. My point is, I met, I, I, I spoke with, with, uh, and I don't know if, if Alderon was on this grand jury. Was Alderon on, a member of this grand jury? He was probably providing testimony. I don't know if he was on the grand jury. I'm sure he was interviewed. I'm sure he was. So um, we're, we're very fortunate. Patrick kind of started to go there. We're very fortunate that we are ahead of the game here and largely because of, of Alderon and his efforts. Um, I was a little disappointed that the grand jury didn't mention anything about agricultural lands, which is where most of the inundation is going to inundation is going to occur first, and and a lot of the protective structures are are surrounding agricultural land. Um, but we've we've been, I mean, we as a district have spent a great deal of time working on this, and it kind of got put on the back burner in, in during the COVID years. And, and now, and that's what the, my discussion or our discussion with Aldrin and, and um, some folks was, is it's time to get that back on the agenda again. And the county, I mean, what, what I think everybody, um, what I think what we all have discussed is that the county is gonna have to be the lead agency on this and put not just, not just the Eel River bottoms or the Arcata bottoms or the Eureka um, uh, the humble Bay areas, the entire county needs to be on some sort of program where you, you there's going to have to be some some pretty significant work done, excavation. We could all benefit from this, create a mitigation project that mitigates all the impacts from all the all the the work that's going to be done, and do it in such a way that it benefits listed species. You know, lock and smelt and and co salmon and um, and helps flooding watersheds. There's just a, a a myriad of things that could all be figured out if and when someone puts the whole package together. And I think it's probably my understanding the county's responsibility to do that with all of its helping because um, it 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 been brought to us. You know, it 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 has come before the board asking us to be that entity. And it just doesn't, we're just not the entity because we don't have the jurisdiction. 
um, and the county does. And so there's there's people at the county that know all about this, and and I, I'm I'm highly confident that we can come up with a pretty good plan. That that when I say we, I mean, all of us as stakeholders or constituents. Um, but I think Michael at the county is. Um, I haven't seen Michael in a while, but I think he's got a really good handle on what needs to be done. Well, I'm and Aldrin. I wouldn't. I wouldn't be surprised if there's quite a bit of grant money in this realm. Uh, maybe even to where we could like fund somebody as a coordinator with soft money and then figure out who they work for, um, you know, the county or us. We have baywide jurisdiction, which is the area affected by sea level rise. The county has everything else. And so I'm not, I don't think we could just necessarily farm this to the county and put them in a lead position because it's a pretty complicated subject. And our staff, and uh, we have a longer more focused experience on that. So I guess I'm kind of going, we should lead. We should, we should build our staff. This is the future. I think I, I, I've been through all those discussions. I was in that same position or that I took that same view. Um, and, I, and I changed my view, largely just listening to the people that know about it. And Are you saying I should it. listen more? <laughs> <laughs> I should. No, it's hearing, Thank you, it's hearing, Thank you. Okay, I'm hearing you, man. Um, but I, I think that's, I think this grand jury report is, is the, the, the ring of the bell saying it's time to take this up again. And, and, um, I, I, I welcome the district participating in that effort. So do we receive this through a vote or just, uh, approbation? No, from... you just, I just, it's no, no actions required. Yeah. Well, I like their dates. I mean, you know, otherwise things go on forever. Yeah. So answer their questions and. We'll do whatever we can. I mean, I I, I feel we're we're there to serve. Um, I, I just want to add this. Uh, you know, I think there have been so many studies on this, and we basically know what's going on, and we know what what's needed. I think what really needs to happen, and where it's up, and where you're talking about the jurisdictional things, is we need there need to be requirements to start taking some action on this, and. Well, I think that you need someone with the authority to um, make some land use decisions yes. on how this is going to be addressed. You need and, to perk it, though. And, right? and this is really where do we retreat and where do we hold the line? So it's the, it's the, the big question. Yeah, the plan, the plan, but the plan, avoiding the plan, that plan. question doesn't serve anybody. And as a matter of fact, that needs focus grant attention because each of these entities has a different personality and you have to draw them out and win approbation or it's just going to come back on you. I, I think I think I think this has all been discussed, and I think they're they're pretty well they're pretty well along a path that they know what they need to do. Um, oh, that's good. That's yeah, good. I think Thank that's what great. this is about. Yeah. I think that's I, I this is a, a the nudge to get back into this. I think we're pretty far along before the whole COVID thing um, kind of took the wind out of our sails. All right, I'm moving on. Uh, no, I'm not. Anybody from the guy we lost? We lost everyone except for Aaron. Aaron, do you have anything to say um, about the sea also rises? Not at the moment. I think you guys covered it. <laughs> okay, thank but you. Thanks for asking. Somebody else's voice besides our own. Um, so I'm moving on to item 8F. <laughs> Consider approving resolution 2022-06, certifying initial study, mitigated negative declaration, previously adopted by the city of Arcata, establishing findings relative to and approving Harbor District Permit 2022-03 with conditions for the Arcata non-motorized boat launch project. Whew. Ryan, did you write that? No, I did. Oh my God, <laughs> You take put You're that poet, planner, art, Rob. put that planner pin. How about right? that one there? Put a scientist it's, pin. It's got there. a lilt. There it is. There it is again. Uh, yeah, Aaron seconded. All right. So here's an overview. Uh, do you want a staff presentation on this? Uh, maybe, maybe a brief one. Yeah. Brief one. So okay. We, we like both 
That's what I figured. Um, so here's a summary of the impacts, 80 square feet of permanent fill, 750 feet of potential shading, uh, about 4,000 feet of temporary impacts, no impact to eelgrass. We're talking about this location right here. I think one important thing to point out here is that there is an existing non-motorized boat launch, uh, but it is only accessible at the highest of tides. And at low tides, there's a 150 foot span between the end of the dock and access to water. So uh, the new site is here. And here's a drawing, maybe, maybe, there it is. Uh, what's going on here? There we go. So there's the existing one. This is the proposed uh, one. We can zoom in on that. Um, very little ground impacts and the gang walkway here is um, a great so even the shading the impacts are limited to 50% of the footprint. And they've completed a coastal development permit of 401 404 uh, NIMS concurrence uh, and CEQA so we are the last permit to be approved. Here's some of the details on the actual physical components of it. Uh, all the permits are complete except for the Harbor District. Construction is proposed to occur starting in the summer of 22. Uh, the boat launch specific project construction uh, in July. Um, project does not propose any work within jurisdictional waters during the wet season. CEQA, the city adopted a CEQA document already, uh, included mitigation measures as a responsible agency we must review and consider. We have to certify that same CEQA document. Our permit includes our standard conditions of approval and best management practices, and there is staff's recommendation. So we have a motion and a second. Any comments from the board? Like a good thing. The Arcata Marsh is spectacular. You know, the bird life, I go there very frequently. And uh, that short boat ramp was kind of useless. If you think of the tidal cycle, it's like four hours a day or something. There's nothing worse than getting to that spot and realizing that you can't get to where you want to go. I, I have a good friend who spent, spent the night in the mud in Arcata Bay in his boat. And if you tried to get out and walk, no, no, no. It's like quicksand. I spent many nights in Arcata Bay <laughs> and walked around in the quicksand. And I enjoyed every single minute of it. Uh, my experiences with mud is I had to step out of my waders when it got deeper than waist. And somebody had to stick a piece of plywood out there so I didn't, the front half of my body didn't go down. But it must have been different consistency. And of course, you would be an expert in the bay, Greg. So I, I would go walk in the mud with you. <laughs> I would take you. <laughs> it's, hey, teach me how to dig clams. Come on. Okay. Getting romantic or, uh, I, 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 All right. So we, we, any, yeah. I've done it, I've done it all kinds of moons. <laughs> um, any comments from the public on our resolution 2022-6? So we have a motion. A comment from me. I think I'm the only one left on the call. Yeah, talk, talk away. I just wanted to say hi, since I'm the only one here. I'm, I'm oh, representing thanks, the Sierra Club. My name is Erin Gooch. And this is my first Harbor District meeting. And you guys are very informative. It's been a really nice experience. How do you spell your last name, Erin? G-O-O-C-H. G-O-O-C-H. Thank you. Yeah, well, Zoom's kind of cool. You didn't have to drive here. <laughs> I like this hybrid approach. Uh, and so yeah. thank you for participating. Yeah, thanks for having me. All right, so we're, with, uh, we're going out with the roll call. Larry. Uh, Commissioner Coleman. Yes. Commissioner Newman. Yes. Commissioner Higgins. Yes. And President Dale. Yes. Um, so that
that was the, one of those pools, what are okay so you kayak down no you have to carry your kayak i know i got a heavy one too um so larry i i item eight or nine um we had a request to put the uh 1091 1091, 1091 on the agenda yeah so that goes on the bin list other ones we covered woodley dredging decisions not necessarily the next meeting but certainly future or soon custom services and response to the sea also rises and i'd also like to see an update on when the ship and what the expected eta for our cable landing is going to be okay that will not be at the next meeting where are you going to be uh, I guess during the meeting, I'll be at San Francisco Airport. So I might be at 11 and all I'll be on my way back from Sicily. Oh, Sicily. Oh, yeah. Bring some food back with you. All my pockets full of is that your Is that your place of ancestry? That is my, uh, my lovely wife's place of ancestry. Right there, allow me to go with her. Awesome. I'll, I'll bet that's going to be really fun and culturally yeah, I, I would, valuable. I would say. Any, uh, anything else <laughs> for the good of the order? Then I, I move to adjourn. Have a good evening, good week, good month. Happy 4th of July. <laughs>